All right, welcome everybody. So for time's sake, we are gonna get started. I'm sure that people are going to be logging in as we go. So welcome to our webinar on strategies for effectively teaching health education, teacher education, and physical education, teacher education during the COVID era. So our presenters today um, are really, most of us are part of the Professional Preparation Council. Um, and we do have some that are not part of that council, but definitely experts in our field. And so we asked a couple of people to join us in addition to our council members. So in general, the people, um, some of these people might not be here today um, because of conflicts, but these are the people that contributed to the presentation. So um, I myself, my name's Erin Centeo, and I'm at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, and I'm the chair for the Pre Professional Preparation Council. And then we also have uh, Kim Ballard, Susanna Dillon, Stacey Furness, Tisha Jackson, Chris Kinder, Kevin Richards, Ben Schwarmberger, Elizabeth Sharp, and Ben Sibley. So those are gonna be your presenters today. And we have a series of five presentations for you. Each of them are gonna be about 10 minutes. Um, and we're going to switch through them. And so I'm just going to kind of kick us off. At the end, we're going to have about 30 to 40 minutes for um, questions and answers that we can hopefully um, help provide further conversation for you um, around health education, teacher education, and physical education, teacher education. So I wanted to essentially start out by um, just giving you a little bit of an overview, which I already did of what we were going to do today. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about some shape resources that you might not be super familiar with. So shape just redid their website and they have a whole COVID-19 resource page, which is very helpful to be able to search on. So check it out. Um, I should also mention that you're going to have uh, access to all of the links. Um, we're going to be putting the links in the chat box as we go, and you'll also be privy to a document that's going to be uploaded on the Shape America website for free that will also have all of these links. So don't feel like you frantically need to like be writing things down. You're going to have access to everything. Um, so keep that in mind. So Shape has on their website lots of resources. Um, some of those resources are K-12 resources. So if you saw the um, K-12 re-entry consideration webinars that happened in July, those are posted up there. Um, your uh, PEAT undergraduate students or HEAT students can go on and watch those for free as well as you can. And um, if people want to earn continuing education credit, that's all up there. Uh, also on the SHAPE website is guidelines for online physical education in that resource page. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. There's also all kinds of K-12 resources. So like videos on how to do things, uh, whether it's like filming yourself, um, all the way to like activities and things that you could implement in the gym. In addition, we just wanted to provide you with some just general overarching things that you might not be aware of that the CDC has out. So there's a guidance document for institutions of higher education. Um, obviously, that's most of us that are on this call, as well as um, some guidance documents for schools and childcare, as well as day camp programs, and then some things around cleaning and disinfecting for public spaces. So I thought that those might be helpful for people even outside of an education standpoint. Maybe some of you are doing research um, in those areas. And so I wanted to make sure that you just had quick and easy access uh, for that. So the first group that's going to be presenting is Stacy Furness from the University of Wisconsin River Falls, as well as Chris Kinder from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And then I'll uh, tag in a little bit at the end of that presentation. So go ahead, Stacy. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm so happy that you could, could come to our meeting. Um, one of the things uh, that you want, may want to consider during this time of COVID is incorporating trauma-informed strategies um, in your HEAT and PEEP programs. So trauma-informed strategies, um, what trauma-informed is, is it's recognizing and responding to the impact of traumatic stress on everyone in your school community. And of course, <laughs> during this COVID time, there is new grief and loss being experienced um, by our own faculty members, by our students, and then by the K-12 school community as well. Um, financial strains, issues of safety and security, all kinds of trauma that is affecting schools and therefore really affecting a child's ability to learn and a child's ability to thrive. 
And so trauma-informed schools make sure to address these traumas in order to make sure that students are able to learn and thrive in a school environment. And there are many levels of interventions for trauma-informed schools. And I'm just gonna talk about a couple of them today, but I do want you to know that the National Child Traumatic Stress Network has amazing resources, um, not just for trauma-informed schools, but specifically to during this time of COVID. And I would really encourage you to go to that resource that is at the bottom of these slides at some point, because there's just a lot of information. You know, the first level of care that we really wanna think about as HEAT and PEAT faculty is taking care of ourselves. Um, you know, this is a very stressful time for us as we're trying to teach our students and we are trying to um, change some of our teaching strategies, teach in ways that we've never taught before, try to bring field experiences to our HEAT and PEAT students in ways that we would have never imagined we had to do. So we need to show a lot of self-compassion for ourselves. We want to, you know, check in with ourselves, use these coping mechanisms that we tell our students to use because our own students are going to look to us as faculty to be role models for, for practicing um, self-compassion and using social supports, relying on other faculty members, relying on friends and people that can help you um, as well get through these challenging times. We also have the level of our own students. We have our own HEAT and PEAT students to consider, and we might wanna use the trauma-informed strategies with them. Clear communication and regular routines is so important for safety and security in trauma-informed schools. One thing we wanna really do is show appreciation for our students' efforts. I know with my own students in my program, some t during this uh, time, they're maybe not performing at the level that I've had some semesters perform at, but I'm probably not teaching at the level maybe I've done in the past. And I try to show as much appreciation and, and positive reinforcement because I know these are very challenging times for our own students. Um, as far as our students and the students they will teach, that's another level of, of, of trauma-informed care that you wanna use with your HEAT and PEAT students teach them these strategies knowing that when their student teaching or when they get their first job 12 months from now, they're gonna have a lot of their own students struggling with trauma. And so these strategies can work with their K to 12 students who they will undoubtedly have a number of students who are struggling um, when this uh, COVID time ends and how they re-enter the regular school. And so again, to reinforce going to the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, to know that social emotional learning, which is such such a part of what we are as HEAT and PEAT programs and what you're going to hear more about in, in just a second, the social emotional learning practices are a big part of trauma-informed care. So also use those resources to um, address trauma issues during COVID. Thank you, Stacey. Um, and I think as, as everybody knows, um, social emotional learning has has been highlighted um, with the emergence of, of COVID-19. I think we all agree that um, SEL is a critical component of education even before COVID. Um, and implement, implementation of social emotional learning practice and programs has, has become a major priority of schools, um, especially those who have adopted the whole school, whole community and whole child model. Um, and so, of course, um, as PEAT faculty, PEAT and HEAT faculty, we want to focus on how we're going to be addressing social emotional learning in our PEAT programs and HEAT programs. And uh, I think it's going to be wise, or I think it would be wise for faculty, faculty to ensure that um, students, just like Stacy mentioned, are aware that the pandemic has sort of um, highlighted the need to focus on social emotional learning because of um, the, the mental illnesses and the, and the trauma that students are, are um, experiencing as a result of the virus. Um, but also, I think we want to um, make sure that we teach them or, or uh, effectively show them how to apply these in, uh, trauma-informed strategies that were just discussed. Um, and so, with this in mind, um, I think PEAT programs should intentionally incorporate SEL into their curriculum by devoting time to allow students to um, creatively develop lessons or units that 
um, address SEL. And um, one way they can do that is you could show them this um, physical education and SEL crosswalk document that is offered by Shape America. Um, and this crosswalk document shows you um, or provides you uh, the crossover between the CASEL SEL core competencies, which are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making, um, and how those align with our national standards. Um, one strategy you could do to implement in your PEAT program would be to allow the PEAT and HEAT students to unpack your national standards or your state standards and see how they um, are parallel to these CASEL core competencies and how you can integrate um, social emotional learning into your own lessons, instant activities, closures. Um, and uh, Aaron, will you go on to the next slide for me? Um, here's just an example of, or, or a, a, a picture of the crosswalk document and how um, they do align with our national standards. Um, for instance, you can teach self-management or, or, or specifically organization skills by having your students um, practice a, perform, uh, a specific skill. And I think um, you could get really unique and see how um, you can use these castle core competencies to address um, skills that, are, are, that we're trying to focus on in the online environment. Um, and uh, with that in mind, uh, the last thing is uh, another way we could address SEL is to provide them, uh, our teacher candidates, with unique um, service learning experiences. I know that we're kind of limited with what's going on with COVID and, and the shift to online learning, but um, there's, you know, unique opportunities to provide um, in-service teachers with support, perhaps even um, providing them opportunities to do the Health Moves Mind program. Um, which Aaron's going to briefly talk about. Ah, thanks, Chris. Okay, um, so there is a um, a couple of books coming out. I think next fall, uh, Shape is releasing some books around social emotional learning in physical education as well as health education. So something to keep an eye out for. It doesn't help right now, um, but that's something that you might be thinking about in the future as you think about your curriculum for your heat and peak students. Um, so Health Moves Minds is a free service learning program that essentially provides movement-based lessons, activities, and community building ideas to essentially encourage students to thrive both emotionally and physically. And you sign up on Shape America's website. Um, it could be a fundraiser, but it doesn't have to be. And I think that that's something like we as higher ed people don't necessarily, we hear a lot about Health Moves Minds, but we don't necessarily, necessarily know what it is. And so although like when you sign up, it looks very um, fundraiser focused, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So as um, HEAT and PEAT professionals, we can introduce Health Moves Minds to our students. And once you sign up, there is a lot of access to curriculum around social emotional learning at the elementary, middle and high school levels. And so I would encourage you to look into Health Moves Minds. Um, the links are being posted there to sign up for it and then look at what um, curriculum they offer because I think it's a good way to kind of tie it into our undergraduate programs and have our students like look at those lessons and figure out like how they might be able to promote these social emotional learning activities um, within the school. Uh, there was an article published by Joe Bird recently um, by our colleagues uh, Linker and Deutsch and it it essentially talks about how to integrate Health Moves Minds into a PEAT program, but I see it similarly, you can integrate it into your HEAT programs as well. I think that it's also an opportunity to be able to kind of foster relationships between in-service teachers, our pre-service teachers, and us as faculty members at the university. So if we look at um, an example, I know um, Northern Colorado University, uh, they had a partnership with the local schools essentially to host a big Health Moves Minds event. Um, and it was part of the fundraiser event for the schools, but they were doing it on the campus of Northern Colorado. And if I don't get all the details right, I apologize. But basically the idea was that they had this giant field day and the schools were bussed over um, 
and they were able to essentially the undergraduate PEAT students put on the program and the K-12 students were able to participate. And so you can use these um, the event that the teachers might be using for a fundraiser in addition to kind of build those relationships and those relationships are so important right now when we think about this COVID era because we we really need to reach out to our cooperating teachers to make sure that they're okay to make sure that the our in-service teachers in the schools are doing okay and try to help them in as many ways as we can and our next group of presenters is going to talk about how we might be able to bridge some of those relationships through field experiences so i'm going to let um, ben sibley from appalachian state university and elizabeth sharp from colorado mesa university kind of take over hi so securing public school placements during the pandemic has been a real challenge um, here at appalachian state uh, we've been able to secure placements for our student teachers but other school-based placements have largely been eliminated. So we've put together some ideas for internship activities for teacher candidates working with public school students in virtual environments, as well as some ideas to replace field experiences when even those virtual internships are unavailable. So first, uh, we'll look at some virtual internship ideas. And we've got some lesson planning and content development activities. And these are activities that can largely be done offline. And the key here really is reaching out to and communicating with your cooperating teachers in the schools and finding out what types of materials that they need and would be most beneficial to them. Um, so some examples are uh, having our teacher candidates develop short content focused videos on essential topics for review and to fill in gaps that can be used on virtual learning days. Um, they can assist with locating and vetting online instructional materials or they can take some of those online materials and contribute to making them more accessible by helping with things like closed captioning, narrating slide presentations, um, reading text aloud, things like that. So those are all activities, again, that can be done offline and that would largely be done in a virtual, uh, an asynchronous learning environment. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, then we have some instruction and assessment activities. Um, and so these are things that, again, we've done in a virtual environment, probably through something like uh, Zoom, um, where students can actually interact with students, uh, with the, the public school students. Um, I know here at Appalachian, some of our early field experiences are tutoring types of experiences where students can go out in schools and have contact with, their uh, with public school students. And they're not necessarily a formal classroom environment. It's more about getting some contact hours in the students. So a lot of these activities could replace those uh, types of live experiences. Um, so examples, one, just doing observations. Uh, so Go React is an online tool that uh, allows for virtual uh, observations and virtual um, supervision. So a lot of schools I know are using this to supervise student teachers virtually, but our teacher candidates can also use Go React to observe uh, live classroom experiences that are going on at the schools. Um, again, to replace some of those tutoring types of activities, uh, we can have our teacher candidates work with small groups uh, in virtual environments to reteach or fill in gaps. Uh, they can spend time with assigned focus students or small groups for tutoring or remedial learning, working with students to provide feedback on work that has been submitted virtually or even grading and providing that feedback on, the, on that work. Um, and then they could also do uh, projects like assisting with screening and benchmarking activities. So this will include analyzing and reflecting on collected data to identify learning gaps and targeted plans for, for student interventions. Next slide. Um, and then when those virtual learning experiences are, are not available, um, we have some ideas for just some other activities that you can do on campus that could replace uh, what we normally might be using field experiences for. Um, so many of you are aware probably of Atlas. Atlas is an online database of classroom videos um, that a lot of uh, has a lot of videos that teachers have submitted for their national boards, I believe. Um, so we can use, if that's a subscription service, so university would have to subscribe to it and then you can have students get access to that database. 
And then there's all kinds of ideas of things you can do with those videos. Um, so example, they could watch a video and then reverse engineer it essentially and write a lesson plan based on what they observed. Um, they could uh, reflect on the video and discuss modifications or changes that they would make to the lesson. Um, they could analyze the use of effective instructional strategies, classroom management skills, student engagement, um, and so on. So those uh, online videos can be a great tool to replace uh, op live observations we might have normally done. Another option uh, that we've used uh, here at Appalachian some is having students plan or having our interns plan and facilitate uh, developmentally appropriate activities with other youth populations, essentially. So um, this could include working with younger siblings, uh, children of family or friends, uh, or children of university faculty even. Um, so this could be something that could be completed virtually or it could be done in person, uh, obviously while practicing social distancing. Um, so that's something you can provide as an option for a, a project, for example. That's obviously going to depend on the individual student's access to those youth populations. And then so, some other options. Uh, Using GoReact or just really any video recording software, interns can create videos of themselves teaching a mini lesson uh, to a, a theoretical audience. Um, so the focus here would be on content knowledge, instructional strategies, and sequencing. Um, and I've actually had to use that this semester as a replacement for my next bullet point. So micro teaching, uh, a lot of our programs. Uh, rely on micro teaching or peer teaching within the college classroom and we've uh, we found this semester we've had to rely on those more heavily even. Um, one example our class where we normally do a, a trial run of EdTPA out in the public schools uh, we've had to replace the live teaching component of that with a, a micro teach here on campus um, but I've also found this semester teaching my live face-to-face -face classes where I've had peer teaches schedule that I've had a lot of students miss them because they are out and they're in self-isolation due to COVID. And so they've I've actually had them do the, the first bullet point as a replacement for the, um, the micro teaching that they were scheduled to complete. Um, then there's a variety of on-campus field experiences uh, we can do. Um, one here at Appalachian, we have one that's uh, I think fairly unique. We have our senior level uh, undergraduate physical education majors teach a university physical activity class. So it's an eight week university physical activity class. It's done under the supervision of an instructor of record who's monitoring all of the instructional activities. Um, but our undergrad uh, PE majors are actually the lead teachers on the class and they manage and deliver the majority of the class. Um, I would refer you to the, the article in the, the chat there um, from Physical Educator where we kind of outline the details of that if you want more information on, on that program. Um, and then a lot of us have homeschool PE programs as well and that's a great opportunity to have our students interacting with children in a, a, a school-like environment but one that's more controlled that we have here on campus. And I'm going to let Elizabeth take over now and she's going to give us some more concrete examples of some of these ideas I just talked about. Thanks, Ben. So I typically have a normal homeschool PE program that happens on my campus, but this semester we weren't allowed to have it and had to switch it to a virtual setting. And so I've learned a lot about teaching how to teach online PE as well as teaching PEAT online. Um, but the kind of nitty gritty of how we did it is I have 10 students in my secondary methods course and we reached out to the homeschool families and had 30 kids that registered. We typically give them choice since that's um, good practice in secondary. And um, so what my students did is they designed activities on Google Classroom that would take about one hour a week. And then we do a live class on Zoom where they're actually teaching the class live um, with the students. We've learned about all the tips and tricks um, with angling your video camera just right and with sound um, and getting everything coordinated with the students as well as their parents and 
helping them. Um, the great thing about this activity is not only are my students, is their confidence built with um, being able to interact with students virtually, but um, I had never incorporated Google Classroom into this program before. And so now my secondary students are learning how to grade, how to put content on the LMS um, and how to communicate with parents and families and students um, through Google Classroom. And I feel like that's a really unique skill that they've learned um, because of us switching our program to the online environment. The next slide um, shows another thing that I did um, to be creative. This is what I actually did when I was in panic mode in March and all of my classes went online and we still had a lot of teaching that we needed to get done. Um, so what I did was I created content topics for my three methods classes that I was teaching that semester and the students signed up for a different content topic and had to record about an eight to 10 minute video and the link is in the chat that takes you to um, about the 90 to 100 videos that my students recorded and my big purpose with this was that we weren't just going to focus on fitness like a lot of PE teachers had started recording videos on but we were going to actually teach content progression um, with creative equipment ideas from their home and you can see some of the examples there on the slide of some of the topics we did including things that were for the entire family um, and it was just really fun for my students to do some of them actually created almost YouTube personas um, and their own YouTube channels that they have since sent to principals as a way to promote themselves as this is what I can do and so um, it's created another unique opportunity for my students and they've become very comfortable with creating these short little videos that take students through content. So those are just two um, ways that I've tried to incorporate um, still getting teaching experiences, field experiences, um, but doing it in that online environment. All right, thanks Elizabeth and Ben. So we're gonna switch now to our next presentation, which is about teaching in a virtual environment. And um, Tisha Jackson from Townsend University um, helped head up this section, but unfortunately she had an emergency, so she's not gonna be able to be here. Um, and then we have Chris again presenting and Kim Ballard from Campbell University. So I'm gonna start us off just by introducing um, a document that you might or might not be aware of. So the guidelines for teaching online physical education are posted on the SHAPE website and Kim posted the link there in the chat box for you. And essentially um, it goes over these bullets here. So what is online physical education? What are the appropriate practices and recommendations? Sample learning activities and assessment strategies. Um, sample online physical education lesson modules and assessments as well as online course tools, resources to enhance learning, and assessing the quality of online PE courses. So this is essentially like what a, a K-12 teacher would take and use if they were going to teach online physical education. Now I think it is important to understand that we're in a pandemic, so this guidance document is amazing. Um, in general, but it also like we need to kind of make sure that we're kind of checking ourselves and realizing that all of this isn't going to be able to happen right now because we're kind of in like this crisis mode and making things work. But as we think about like, how do we need to prepare our peat and heat students in the future for online physical education? Like, is this going to be more of a thing now after or post pandemic? Um, this guidance document might be helpful for you. So the next thing that we wanted to just kind of touch on is this idea of appropriate practices and recommendations. So as we're um, thinking through like what does a K-12 experience look like online or with distance learning and what are best practices that we need to communicate to our health ed and our PE in, uh, pre-service teachers, what are the things that we need to think about? So the, the first thing we just wanted to point out was good teaching is good teaching. So we need to keep in mind the same things that we would keep in mind normally that um, you know, they need good communication skills. They need a lesson plan. They need that set time. Um, they need their routines. They need all of these things that we know. So we got to keep all of those things in. We need, as Elizabeth said, to still allow choice for students. So we need to be teaching our physical education pre-service teachers that these things are all important in this online environment. The idea of um, promoting independent learning, 
thinking about like how much screen time our students are going to have versus non screen time. So how much time do we want them live or watching videos versus what can we give them that might allow them to kind of go on their own and do physical activity on their own. Having policies in place around um, communication and how often you should be communicating. Is it okay to send three emails a day or is that going to get people like mumble jumbled. They're not going to understand what's going on. Making sure that we're engaging in professional development as all of you are doing right now in how to best teach online learning. And then, of course, like using technology to verify participation. So how do we assess our students and how do we teach our pre service teachers to assess students and what tools should we be using. So I have some apps there that are popular for measuring physical activity, but then going beyond physical activity, like how do we go about thinking about teaching our students how to assess. So those are just kind of some global ideas um, to think about as we prepare our students for this kind of online environment. Chris? Thanks, Aaron. Um, and, and just as, as Aaron had suggested about um, keeping in mind that good teaching is good teaching and, and that we need to um, also be concerned about our students um, from a, a social emotional perspective. We need to uh, attempt to foster a community with COVID. We've all seen higher education institutions are shifting to online and um, this has caused students to, to feel isolated, especially in our peat heat programs. Um, they're not allowed to to see each other, to go out and field, to field experiences with each other. And so um, we need to recognize um, the importance of attempting to uh, create a sense of belonging um, with our students, um, foster these student peer relationships as well as faculty and student relationships. Um, and, and think creatively how you're doing that if you're delivering instruction uh, purely online. Um, are you devoting time to build relationships um, by um, at the beginning of the lesson by just checking in, checking in on students and how they're doing? Um, you know, with COVID, they've they've been hit hard financially, mentally, um, and so um, I think it's our job to make sure that they're doing okay and we're checking in on them. And so um, more than ever, I think it's important that we're we're trying to build this sense of community for our PEAT programs and HEAT programs. And so um, finding unique ways, um, I know at the University of Illinois, we're, we schedule virtual happy hours with our students, um, whether they choose to um, be alcoholic or non-alcoholic, but um, that's their choice. But we're at least getting together. Um, we're finding time outside of school to um, you know, interact and, and build relationships and and feel like we we belong um uh as kim's about to talk about there's um all these ways that uh we as p faculty can use engaging tools um online and i think pete collaborative's team has done a great job providing us some of those tools um some of these tools include kahoot um uh, flipgrid and, and many more and so if you want um to look, if you need some some help and, and you know you're stuck in a rut um, teaching online, uh, be sure to go ahead and check Pete Collaborative's website. Um, it's posted in the chat. Um, but with that, I'm gonna pass it along to Kim, and she's gonna kind of give her personal experience on on teaching in a virtual environment. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I, I'm in a little bit of a unique situation because all of my students are getting ready to go out and student teach next semester. And so they're a little overwhelmed, uh, to say the least. So it was, it was a little bit easier for me in some ways. And I, I try to take full advantage of this situation and reach out to colleagues all over the country, um, K-12 teachers, um, whoever I could and get them in my classroom talking to my students about things that were going on. What were the hard parts? What are the easy parts? You know, what was working? What was not working? And, uh, and, and letting them know that they felt like first year teachers all over again. And, uh, and I told them I did too. You know, they, they looked to me as a leader, but then at the same time, I told them this was something new for me that I'd never done either. And I was, you know, something very new. So it was good to just let them know and talk to that. But these are some of the things that came up that I, I thought was be really important to share. Um, 
district decisions change almost every day, it seems like. As soon as we get ready for something, they turn around and change into something else. And, you know, they're in school or they're back out of school. And so this thing of pivoting um, is a key word, but it's also something we need to teach them anyway. Our students are going to have to learn to change on a dime sometimes. They come in and the gym's not ready or the fields are not ready or something's going to happen. So I think that's a strategy that we can continue to do, but they uh, can learn that right now um, on having to, to have lessons both ways, like for rainy days or whatnot. And if we can make that connection to them, that's something that we can keep them uh, online with what, what they need to know anyway. Um, and the online guidelines, I really mean more about um, guidelines that are for return to school guidelines, basically, and they're updating. So the same guidelines are always out there because as the, the virus changes at some places and we go back and, you know, then we leave again. And uh, so sometimes the guidelines change a little bit and it's just good that we teach them how to find that information. It's a great, you know, it's one of our standards in health education anyway, um, how we find that information and we teach kids that information and we, we keep up with that information and knowing that over time is changing and, and it can go back uh, either way. One of the things they also told me was that it was a great idea because the kids were so overwhelmed with so much to do to just find out what learning management system that the local school district was using. Just find out. In my county, we reached out and they said, we use Google Classroom. So our job then was to find out, okay, let's get our kids Google Classroom certified. That was our first thing. We talked to education. That's what we did. And now we're working on all the apps that work with Google Classroom. That's what we're trying to teach them. So any of the things that work within that, we're trying to get them to create or whatnot. And I'm bringing, ex I don't know how to do them all. So I'm bringing experts into the class to help them learn some of those apps. And they have to, after the, the uh, expert comes in to help us, then they have to go create at least one slide or two slides or something so that, and it has to be something that meaningful that they're gonna get back to. Of course, they're writing all down the directions and making videos of that as well. So, you know, it, and the extended learning time back to the classroom, I think that as somebody's already said it earlier, is that what they're doing now can be something that we can use later because the technology is going to last us way beyond I think this pandemic for example what happens when you know we have snow days um, I think that that's one of those things that you know I don't think we'll ever have just snow days anymore I think that that's going to be an opportunity that we don't have to make those up at the end of the year and that we can you know find some ways that students can still be able to do school at home sometimes what I would warn us about is making sure that you know, this isn't something that continues for a long time, that we can just do it all the time online, that physical education becomes an online class because I do not think that that's what we need to be doing. But think about giving homework. Most physical educators don't give homework or health educators don't give homework. So, you know, maybe if they haven't been doing that, that this is a good time to do that because now they're kind of used to doing something at home. And if we don't give homework, it looks like that school is the only place that we can do that physical activity. In this pandemic, we're teaching people that they can do it at home and in the community to uh, continue on. So thank you for being here. Um, these are just some of the uh, systems, and I think Erin's going to talk to you a little bit about those. Yes, thank you, Kim. So we realize that many of you have probably been participating in professional development, and so these might not be new to you, but we wanted to make sure that we mentioned some of the key things that we've been using in our classrooms, or specifically I've been using with my physical education and health pre-service teachers that I found engaging and helpful um, to be able to give them the opportunity to engage and have that connectedness that Chris was talking about earlier. So I separated these into categories. Um, the first one is about videos and teaching skills. So not being able to be in the, in the schools, we have really struggled here at University of Hawaii to be able to give our students the experiences that they're missing out in the field that they would have for observations or in those teaching environments. And so um, Atlas was already talked about, Ben talked about it earlier, but we have used that. It's fairly inexpensive. I think it's like 20 to $30 per student. So um, not too bad, depending on how big your, your program is. But there's essentially 35 between the elementary and secondary videos that are there. The videos are around 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the clip. And then there's all kinds of information that the teacher reflects on. And so depending on what you want your 
students to focus on, those can create some really dynamic assignments and experiences for your students. Um, another um, website that my colleague uses is Dynamic PE ASAP. And so this is through the Dynamic Physical Education textbook. Um, Dr. Pangrazi has all kinds of videos and these videos aren't whole classes, but they're pieces um, according to their kind of like system that they teach in that elementary physical education program. I think it goes up till eighth grade, but there is some great material on that website. So you might wanna check that out if you're searching for those like teaching experiences that you need observations for. And then another one is a textbook that's actually offered through McGraw-Hill. And this one isn't necessarily about teaching videos. We actually use this one for skill um, in our uh, introduction to physical activity courses. So I'm thinking about like our team sports classes or our net wall um, classes. So Get Active 3.0 is a textbook that works through McGraw-Hill Connect. And in there they have like, I think it's like 18 chapters of different activities like badminton. Um, I mean, they have tons of sports in there. And then for each chapter, they have videos that go along with it. So if you're looking for skill videos for your students to watch and then be able to create their own skills. So like our students have to go through the whole online module and then they watch the videos and then they have to replicate the videos make their own video and then turn it into us. And that's how we're, we're doing their skill grades for their competency um, for those skills in our classes. So just a couple of ideas for you. Um, when I try to get discussion and collaboration going in my classes, I typically fall back on two different things besides like just a normal forum in your class. So I use Jamboard and that's um, this thing right here is my Jamboard. So I typically do this activity around CISPAP um, where the, it's like a gallery walk where the students have to go around and like add different things that they think would go under each of the components of a CISPAP. And so we actually did that online with Jamboard. So if you're unfamiliar with Jamboard, it's a digital whiteboard that everybody can access at once. And it works with sticky notes or you can like draw on it. It's very interactive. So my students essentially like did their gallery walk online when we were in Zoom and I just gave them the link to the Jamboard. So um, that's a great tool that I use. And then Flipgrid, if you haven't heard of it, um, you can post your video online up to 10 minutes. You can reply via video and it's actually made by educators. And so you can do your grade book, everything can be in there. Um, and it actually seamlessly enters into most uh, learning management systems. And so it's a really good tool to be able to connect your students. And then the last one that I wanted to mention was Edpuzzle. So if you're unfamiliar with Edpuzzle, basically you have like a video, say like a lecture, and you want to test for understanding of your students because we all know that they're probably not even watching our lectures that we spend hours making, right? And so Edpuzzle allows you to upload it into Edpuzzle and you can um, pin questions throughout the lecture and then it'll actually like grade their question, your questions and stuff in it. Um, I think you can host up to 20 videos free, but if your university, a lot of universities now have like licenses. And so I would encourage you to like, when you sign up, it'll automatically upgrade your license if your university has like a university license. So something super simple, but yet engaging that you can get through your students. So the last thing that we just wanted to mention was this idea of moving beyond the pandemic. So when we think about virtual learning beyond the pandemic, what is it gonna look like and how are we gonna adjust our teaching strategies, both in health and physical education for our pre-service teachers? And so like, do we need to be continuing to teach all of this virtual online content? Do they need to be prepared in this online environment? How much of this online environment are they gonna be using beyond once we're past COVID-19? So like for my students right now, they're using, they go through the Google certification. So there's like uh, 13 modules or units in the initial Google certification. It's educator one level, but that's something that they can essentially take the exam and put it on their resume. Do I wanna keep that in my class moving forward? I'm thinking so because once we, we've gone here and so now I'm thinking like flip, Flip classrooms like we might use flip classrooms more in higher education but we're also probably going to be teaching our students to kind of take advantage of some of this technology that has brought been brought into the school building and so where does that leave us should we be um, hosting PE during snow days as Kim was alluding to and so that's kind of a question that I think our field needs to really think about moving forward 
All right, so we have uh, Ben Schwarmberger from Minnesota State University and Susanna Dillon from Texas Woman University, and they're going to talk to you about adapted physical education in this COVID era. Thank you, Erin. Um, so first, I want to emphasize my area of emphasis within the university here at MSU Mankato is not specific to APE, um, unlike Su Susanna. However, uh, it is important regardless that we as teacher trainers try to highlight with our students how they can and should address the needs of students with disabilities across courses within our PEEP programs. Uh, I think it is even more important in the current environment we are in. So with my undergraduate program, teacher candidates may only have one option, which is the required APE course. Um, so I think that's important to be aware of it, unless students are, for example, minoring, minoring in it. Um, this clearly is not enough time to prepare students when working with students with disabilities. So it is critical that we emphasize strategies across the curriculum. So moving into the next slide, um, you can see there using is this, it, oh, Sorry, you can backtrack. So, yep. Yeah, so there you go. Thank you. So identifying and developing connections um, with professionals in the, in the field is going to be really important. Um, whether that be alumni that have graduated um, or just currently existing cooperating teachers. So ideas that you can consider are interviews of APE teachers. This can be a great way to get current teacher candidates to develop a strong awareness of what is currently occurring with APE and physical education teachers and what they're actually enduring. Um, while I have experience teaching K through 12 physical education, I again, don't have experience of what teachers themselves are going through in this COVID pandemic. Um, so I think that's important to be aware of. Another option to consider is uh, homeschool connections. And I know Elizabeth and uh, Ben highlighted this a little bit, but. There are a number of colleagues and myself run homeschool programs as well. And while we can't meet here on campus, an avenue or uh, idea is park meetups. So um, I think it's important to know as peak colleagues uh, can really highlight with, with students and give them practicum experience um, to create more safe and social distance uh, with regard to working with students. So, you can go to the next slide. Actually, Aaron, can we go back just one second? Oh. I want to be clear on something. We, we talked about having university students view live or recorded physical education instruction and have them practice assessment practices, but we want to make sure that they understand that it's not appropriate for them to assess kids with disabilities for the purpose of eligibility in a virtual context. Just want to make sure that's clear to everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Susanna. So um, I think Suzanne is actually going to cover the um, first bullet point here on university students zooming into gym and classrooms. Right. So we've had a lot of success over the last, um, well, since March, in having our students zoom into gymnasia and classrooms um, and to provide support to the general physical educators as well as the adapted physical educators whether that be in partner PE classes, which are called a variety of different things across the US. Sometimes they're partner PE, bridge programs, um, unified classes. We've also had our students zoom into special education classrooms because in some schools, they've chosen to have the students stay within their classroom and then have the teachers rotate or move. Um, and so that allows us to get into the special education classrooms and support those um, teachers while also providing our students with a um, experience. This summer, we had the opportunity to be quote unquote virtual personal trainers um, for some students who were in a transition academy program. Um, and they zoomed into homes, uh, sometimes into group homes, and into um, classes to provide one on one or two on one uh, virtual personal training. The other thing that you might want to consider doing in your adapted physical education classes in higher ed is having parents or other service providers like OTs, PTs, teachers of the visually impaired, o &M specialists, et cetera, uh, zoom in or um, if it's possible on your campus, because I know not every university is fully online right now, some are functioning in a hybrid format, uh, to do a socially distant face-to-face -face option. Um, we have done this uh, via Zoom. We also did a socially distant movie viewing of, um, Phoenix Rising, which was very cool this fall. 
Um, I will also say, just stay on there real quick, sorry, Erin. Um, with the virtual um, trainer, if you have Squirkit, I know that many PE teachers have used Squirkit. Um, Delia Powell did a Squirkit tutorial on how to um, develop this for using in uh, a virtual capacity. And um, that link's been provided on the resource site. So um, if you're interested in doing that, go ahead and jump over to um, the resource site. The other thing I might encourage you to, what? I was saying is post the other thing I might. Okay, great. The other thing I might encourage you to do is look at some of the resources that have been developed by either major organizations in adaptive physical activity or by um, various centers that are very often supported by the government. National Center on Health and Physical Activity and Disability has a enormous um, uh, repository of videos, articles, et cetera. Some that I might consider you um, looking at are things that are more like professional development for your students, like how to maintain a wheelchair, and there's a variety of different things on wheelchair maintenance, uh, as well as programming such as adapted uh, yoga for kids, or they have a whole series on TheraBand exercises for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Blaze Sports, which is a national adapted sports organization, has again a good number of resources. And they have this really cool deep dive webinar series. There's three of them specific to individuals with spinal cord injury, uh, cerebral palsy, and amputations or limb loss, which are I would highly recommend for inclusion in your classes if you're looking for content for your students. Um, the Center on Technology and Disability has a webinar that Scott McNamara developed that looks at integrating assistive technology in adapted physical education. And the link for that is also um, provided. Scott McNamara also has a um, blog series called What's New in Adapted PE. And I know that a good number of uh, folks in higher ed are using selected podcasts from that or having students go out and find one and investigate it and do a reflective piece on that. And he's interviewing people from across the US and beyond about things that are associated with physical education and adapted physical education. Um, you may also want to join one of the National Consortium for PE for Individuals with Disabilities, APE social, um, much like what we referenced before, a way for us to connect with our students and have our students connect to other professionals. And um, the hashtag NCPEID or at NCPEID on Facebook uh, will keep you up to date on when those socials are held. The last thing, and you can kind of see this picture down here um, of the pool, is we are doing at Texas Women's University some socially distant face-to-face -face instruction. Um, and literally within the next hour, my students will be arriving to provide socially distant aquatic exercise um, at that pool space with individuals with um, disabilities. We're doing outdoor education activities, fitness and recreational games in an outdoor capacity. I know, it might be a little bit easier for us to do that in Texas for a larger part of the year than other states, but um, I do think it's something that we could consider uh, as a way for us to continue getting our students access to quality and authentic experiences with um, persons with disabilities. We're also at that group center um, doing combinations with SLP with food tastings. And that's something that we could very easily incorporate with health education programming as well. Um, if you're doing completely online instruction, I, Aaron mentioned this earlier, how do we get our students to interact? One of the things that we've done, the content area of adapted physical activity is sometimes very foreign for our undergraduate students. And sometimes we need to get them into those smaller groups. So I would encourage you to consider the use of breakout rooms for discussions um, and or looking at, do you have graduate students who could participate in class discussions and help act as peer leaders or peer mentors? Um, and using Kahoot, the paid version that allows you to do polling inside of classes and then get the results back to find out where are your students um, having difficulty with the content and where are they having success. We're also starting to use green screens. I would really have you um, encourage, highly encourage you to have your students look at some of the work by Jody Duff and Dave Martinez and Amy Anschbacher. And again, we'll get those links to you. Um, they're using uh, green screens to create these really cool and fun innovative videos and our students are starting to do that as well. Um, ben, I know you had in here um, information about designing and implementing homemade equipment as a, a part of an undergraduate project. Do you want to talk to that a little bit? 
Yeah, so I guess um, I'll hit on that bullet point previously initially, just emphasis on dual individual sports and lifetime sport versus team. Um, I think it is important to really understand activities that are more or less appropriate in our current time. So example, I'm currently teaching fundamental motor skill courses. And while emphasis generally is on a variety of game forms like invasion, um, be considerate in how you can revise the activities to try and ensure social distancing can occur. Um, individual sports can be very good. Um, golf, disc golf, uh, potentially dual sports like pickleball, as well as lifetime activities, which I know we've covered a little bit. Um, looking at that next bullet point, designing and implementing homemade equipment. This is actually something I learned about just this fall from my own colleague, um, Sue Tar, who you see the article there, Simple Recipes for Making PE Equipment, um, was done by her and a fellow colleague. But the idea here is to encourage our students to really think critically based on student needs, but also to consider with regard to standards and outcomes we're trying to address. Um, the recipes can be passed on to families as well to further support uh, pre-K 12 students in APE and PE. And I think an important consideration to also be aware of is budgets. Um, we obviously don't really know where budgets are going to be, but knowing more than likely budgets are going to be very tight, especially now, um, making your teacher candidates aware of how to potentially make homemade equipment, albeit safe, um, can better set them up for success when they do become teachers. And then recognizing the current anxiety levels our students have already been at, as been mentioned before, um, and, but in particular with regard to adapted physical education and physical activity that might be um, outside their area of, of prior knowledge and experience or something that they're unfamiliar with. All right. Thank you, Ben and Susanna, um, for that. And with that, we're going to move into our last part of our presentation, which is about EdTPA in a virtual learning environment for those of you that are going through EdTPA right now. So Stacy Furness and Ben Sibley are going to talk to you about EdTPA. And then after this session, we'll have uh, open uh, question and answers for about 30 minutes or so. So in addition to uh, many of the other changes that we are having to work with, many of you have to support your HEAT and PEAT uh, students as they continue to complete an EdTPA. And you're probably wondering, you know, will my uh, student teacher, my, my um, teacher candidate be able to complete their education teacher performance in a virtual learning environment? And the answer is yes. Um, the uh, Pearson has created some guidance documents, which I'll point to in a minute. And it really helps people understand uh, the differences in expectations when teacher candidates are completing an EdTPA in a virtual learning environment versus a face-to-face. -face. The, um, the virtual learning environment EdTPA allows teacher candidates to combine types of instruction. As we know, a lot of our teacher candidates are teaching in a hybrid environment where sometimes it's face-to-face -face and sometimes it's virtual. And that is absolutely allowable under the virtual learning environment uh, EdTPA. Um, some of the requirements that we are used to seeing in the physical education handbook have changed for the virtual learning environment. So it's important to pay attention to that. We've really been trying to support our teacher candidates with the guidelines of the face-to-face -face, and some of those have changed. In fact, of all the handbooks, of all the handbooks, the guidelines for physical education in a virtual learning environment are the most extensive. So it's just really important to pay attention to that. Whereas the health Education at TPA in a virtual learning environment is, for the most part, very similar to what we're used to when they're teaching in a face-to-face -face environment. Next slide. Some considerations for a virtual learning environment at TPA and physical education. These are just a few. I'm not going to go over all of them, but they do need a minimum of four students. Most of our teacher candidates, when they're doing face-to-face, -face, they have 30 plus students that they're working with, but in a virtual learning environment, they, might, they are allowed to teach a class of four or larger for their virtual learning environment. In task two, the instruction task of the, of the ed TPA, it does have to be synchronous instruction. It has to be the teacher interacting live with the students who show up on the screen, at least four of them. And so that's something to consider as you advise your students. And, and really they wanna see the students as active as possible in those videos. Next slide. Just a couple of other things. 
you really encourage your teacher candidates if they're teaching in a virtual learning environment to make sure their instruction videos also have students demonstrating psychomotor skills that they can use in task three for their assessment videos because that really provides an opportunity where they don't have to be producing as many videos for this virtual learning environment at TPA. Remember that they still have to analyze the psychomotor domain, domain and one other domain, which the other domain doesn't have to be videotaped. It can be, but it could also be in writing. And they do have to have work samples from at least for students, which is the minimum. But as I mentioned, the guidance document um, from EdTPA on um, the virtual learning environment contains all these details and many more. So I would encourage you to use that. Just a couple of things, next slide, for the health education uh, at TPA in a virtual learning environment. Task one and three really have a lot of the same expectations as you're used to seeing in the face-to-face. Ed TPA, so that hasn't changed a lot. One thing from task one that has changed is health education teacher candidates can include more than five lesson plans, recognizing the fact that a lot of times lesson plans in health are very short in a virtual learning environment. So uh, Pearson has allowed more than five for the health education Ed TPA. The two videos in task two have to be synchronous. Just like in, in physical education, those videos have to be synchronous. Students have to be in the video. At least four of the students' faces have to be in the video as well as the instructor, um, at least at, at some point during that synchronous instruction. And next slide. A couple of other things uh, for the virtual learning environment and health education. It's important for both health and FIAD to understand that it is okay if the learning environment changes from the time they did task one planning to task three assessment. In the virtual learning environment handbook, it is acceptable that even though they may have planned for face-to-face -face instruction, by the time they got to the actual instruction or assessment, it might be in a virtual learning environment. Again, for the health education, the whole class can be uh, four students or greater. And, and, and the same guidance document would be helpful for your teacher candidates completing an ed TPA in a virtual learning environment. I'm just gonna share some of the experiences and things that we've learned doing ed TPA over these last two semesters here at Appalachian State. Um, one thing is, it's very important to check your state requirements uh, regarding the ed TPA. Uh, many states have waived some of the requirements in general for educator preparation programs um, and or they've granted extensions on the testing requirements. Uh, for example, here in North Carolina, uh, the requirement is that uh, individuals with teacher licensure have to at least attempt the ed TPA during their first year of licensure and then they have to have passed it by their third year of licensure. Um, now, our university policy was that we were requiring our students to pass ed TPA in order to graduate and get that initial licensure. But we, um, since our state uh, didn't actually require them to pass it to graduate, we were able to waive that requirement um, these last two semesters. So our student, we're still requiring most of our students to at least take ed TPA during student teaching. Um, but even if they don't pass it, we're allowing them to graduate and get their initial teacher licensure. Um, so that's one thing to be aware of. Uh, make sure you check your state requirements. Um, for dual licensure programs, uh, you may need to do a little homework regarding what your state's requirements are for which ed TPA your students need to complete. Uh, for example, here in North Carolina, when we went to the ed TPA website, it said dual licensure students had to complete the physical education ed TPA. Um, Fortunately, we had some people do a little digging and we were able to find that North Carolina actually did not have that stipulation and that our health and PE dual, dual licensure students could actually complete either of those ed TPAs. Um, and for some of our students, the, given their specific situation in their schools, health ed was a much better option in a virtual learning environment than physical education was gonna be. So having that option available to them was a, a big bonus for them. Uh, Finally, I, I said for the most part, we were requiring our students to still take the ed TPA during student teaching. Um, but we did find, we have found that some of our students are just in a, a situation where it would be highly unlikely that they would be able to pass uh, or submit an acceptable ed TPA portfolio. Um, 
And uh, for instance, we have some students this semester that are in high school environments where there's no synchronous instruction going on. Um, so for those students, we've created a waiver process uh, where they can apply for a waiver um, to not have to submit an EdTPA this semester. Um, so we make sure that they're aware of the potential implications of that. For instance, we make sure that they're aware that they are going to have to at least attempt an EdTPA during their first year of licensure when they do go out and get a job. Um, but for a lot of our students, um, you know, having to do EdTPA in this environment was causing them a lot of anxiety. Uh, and th that anxiety uh, in part was around the cost of potentially having to resubmit the EdTPA and having to pay for those resubmissions. Um, there's also a lot of restrictions when you resubmit an EdTPA on being able to reuse content from your previous submissions. And that all depends on which uh, parts of EdTPA you're resubmitting. So um, taking into account those restrictions and those stressors, uh, we, we decided to give some of our students the option of not even trying to uh, submit an EdTPA during their student teaching. Next slide, please. Uh, so this semester, what we've actually found is that most of our student teachers um, actually have ended up having their students returning to in-person instruction um, at the school. So most of our students have actually been able to deliver and video record uh, lessons with students in the gymnasium. It's been far from an ideal situation. Uh, a lot of them had to plan their EdTPA units not having had any contact with their students. And then when the students returned to school, they almost immediately had to go right into their EdTPA teaching segment. Um, but it, it did work out for most of them that they could do live instruction in person. Um, for our students that were definitely going to be in a virtual learning environment for the EdTPAs, we ended up having a lot of them actually recruit a special class just for purposes of their EdTPA. Um, as Stacy explained, you need a minimum of four students. Um, so they can get by with a fairly small group. They could possibly recruit family, friends, children, and faculty, just some dedicated students they found at the school. Um, they have to be aware of some of those requirements. Uh, so cameras have to be on. That's one of the challenges that a lot of our student teachers have found is that their school uh, cannot uh, force students to have their cameras on. And so when recruiting students for the special class, uh, that's something they need to make sure that the students are aware of. That they'll have to have their cameras on for the lessons that are videotaped. Um, and then it's important to make sure that uh, they're, they're meeting those requirements. So in that virtual learning environment, they still have to have live instruction with assessment and feedback being provided in the psychomotor domain. Um, and that has to be captured in those video clips. So those are some of the, the, the considerations that we've found so far doing EdTPA in the, these virtual environments. All right, thank you, Ben and Stacy. Um, we are going to now move into kind of our question and answer session. So we don't have a lot of live questions as of right now. So I'll kind of start um, those questions. So how this is gonna work is there is a question and answer box. We'd prefer you write the question um, in there just so that we can keep it separate from chat, but people can also feel free to give their ideas in the chat as well if you have answers to questions that are being asked. Unfortunately, given the format that we're in, the webinar format instead of like a live Zoom session, um, it, there is an ability to turn your mic on, so we apologize for that. Um, but hopefully we can, if you have any questions, we can answer some of them. So take a minute to um, put those in the question and answer box as well as, or in the chat, um, and we'll do that. And in the meantime, I'm going to answer a couple of questions that came in. So early on, there was a question about a health education crosswalk. And um, there is one that's in its final stages of being approved with Shape America. And we're not 100% sure when it's gonna be released, but it's gonna be released soon. So be on the lookout for that because that health education crosswalk is coming. Um, they are putting the finishing touches on it uh, for that. So that's the first question that was asked. There was another question. Um, I'm thinking that this is for EdTPA uh, folks. So or someone mentioned that their, their state or their districts aren't allowing video to be taken or they're not allowed um, to be videotaped. So is there any way to get around that? Does anybody have any suggestions of what people are running into or maybe what they could do if they don't have the, that video capability? 
One thing I can comment about that is I know when we started into the semester, we were getting that same feedback from a lot of our school districts that um, they could not record uh, students in these virtual environments. And um, we had to do some kind of education with our, our contacts at the school districts. Um, a lot of them thought like legally they just could not do it. It's not, they didn't think they had any say in the matter at all. Um, and so we had to, fortunately, I, my, my program is a part of a large, very active college of education here at Appalachian State University. And so they did some advocacy efforts, um, just provide some information to the school districts about what legally is and isn't allowed. Um, there aren't actual legal restrictions on it. Um, and obviously it's still the call of the individual school districts, but um, we were able to get more school districts to um, allow some video recording in those virtual learning environments. Thanks, Ben. Stacey, did you have anything to add or did anybody else want to add? Well, I think Ben's idea of very specifically recruiting students um, that that you have um, backgrounds with and relationships with that would be willing to take part in it is another very creative way to get videotape of instruction. Great. All right, so another question that we had was the about the McGraw-Hill book that I had mentioned. It's called Active 3.0 or Get Active 3.0 by McGraw-Hill, and it is a Connect textbook. So it is only offered online through the Connect system. If you're not familiar with Connect, at least through our bookstore, it's actually very cheap for our students to get the online book Connect combo. I think the book itself is like 30, like with the online system and everything, which is very beneficial as an instructor. It's about $30. So um, that's the, the name of the textbook. And then um, the next question that I saw was about elaborating on the Google Classroom certification. So I'll take first stab at that. And then if anybody else, I think Kim might have a little bit of familiarity with this. So um, I've had my students, they're ongoing, um, going through the Google Classroom Educator One certification. So I think the link was put in the chat. It'll definitely be posted in the um, link document that, you, that will be on the Shape America website. But from what I can remember off the top of my head, I think it's, it's like 13 to 15 units. Each unit is actually a significant amount of time. So they range from like 45 to like 85, 90 quoted minutes. So what I've been doing with my students is I started it at the beginning and they have one unit assigned a week kind of as like their ongoing project that they're doing. And so we're currently, I think in um, week six. So they've done six units and my students have really enjoyed it. Um, they said that they have learned a lot about um, Google, Google itself. And it's not just about Google Classroom, like it's all kinds of different Google tools to use. So like Google Forms and just things that students don't think about and we might use with them, but they're not necessarily connecting it, that they could use it with their students. And it is from a general education standpoint. So, but what I have my do, students do is reflect on how they actually use it within um, a physical education setting. The certification itself is $10 at the end of that certificate level one. Um, so what I'm doing with my students is highly encouraging them that they have to take the exam to get the certification. But um, each week I have them take a screenshot because there's like, um, questions at the end of each module that they have to answer. So they take a screenshot of that each week to upload it because my fear was knowing my students, they all procrastinate. And so if I told them they had to have it done at the end, they would wait until the last day to try to do that Google certification. So I make them turn it in every week so that I know that they're kind of on track. And then at the end, it's their choice whether they want to take the certification. I highly encourage it, obviously, so that they can put it on their Vita. I think there's two more certification levels, Risto. Um, I'm not really sure uh, what those entail because I haven't really looked into them that much. It was kind of, I heard it on like a, I think it was a Pete um, collaborative call. Someone mentioned it and I'm like, I got to put that in my secondary class. So um, that's about all I know. Does anybody else have any more information on it? Okay. This is Kim. Um, we went Kim? to our education department. That's why I say they, because they did it with all of our um, people that are going out to, to teach because that's what our county was using. 
Yeah, and so a follow up to that, um, Risto asked if they need any face to face. No, it's really just like Google modules that they take you through. So it's all like it's really hands off. And I would encourage you as an instructor um, to try to keep up with it, but we're also teaching in a pandemic. So sometimes that's a little hard. Um, if I haven't gotten to the module, we usually do some, we meet synchronously every other week. And so we'll do some reflection on it in addition to having them post like little reflections about what they learned. So that's kind of how I've engaged my students. Even if I haven't participated in every single unit myself, I kind of get the information from them. All right. Um, the next question that I see on here is, has anybody implemented um, a physical activity program in a K through 12 school and kind of like a work site program? So has anyone implemented a physical activity program in the K-12 school, which might also look like a work site program? Does anybody want to answer? We haven't implemented a, a physical activity program, but the when all of this went down we did reach out to our school districts locally that we've collaborated with and to see kind of what their thought process was on whether or not our students will be able to come to campus um, and do programming and several of them reached back and said you can't come to campus to do programming but we would like to hire your graduate students um, to help us bridge the gap and to fill in um, some of the issues that were created by uh, some of the teachers being on campus and teaching full time during the day and some of them teaching online. So um, we've had that kind of a um, exchange with school districts. So our students are actually getting paid as a part of their master's program. Any other thoughts to this question? So I can talk a little bit. Um, when we got shut down in March, we were um, running an after school program. So it wasn't actually in the school setting. It was here on the university campus and we had students come in live to our campus. Essentially what we did at that point was moved everything virtually and our undergraduate students made videos each week geared towards their individual um, student. It was an adapted physical activity um, after school program. So some of our students um, were students with disabilities and some of our students were neurotypical. And so they essentially had their assigned student and they were making live videos for them or videos for them each week. And then some of the students would send videos back to them and they interacted in that exchange. Um, as part of, so we are not running that program this semester. We decided to give our students some other experiences, um, but I do run a grant program that will be um, working with schools to essentially host socially dis or physically distanced after school programs, um, but we haven't gotten there quite yet and what that is going to look like. But other than that, I don't have any other ideas for you. Um, but people are more than welcome to write in the chat box too if you have ideas about successfully operating those. All right, um, so we'll let that sit. If anybody has any other thoughts about that, that's in the webinar um, and you want to go ahead and tap into the chat. So the next one, um, the next question is, are there any packaged ready to go apps of programs that schools could use to implement physical education? A local school is um, using PLTF4M.com, which is just fitness-based PE. It's better than nothing, but I'm searching for an online all-in-one PE program that classroom teachers could utilize. So I know that there is a paid for program out of California. I do not know the name of it off the top of my head. It has sports in it, maybe sports for all, but I don't think that's right. Um, I can try to look it up. If you email me, I can send it to you. They market themselves as an online PE program. They hire coaches. Um, they offer different opportunities, whether it's they do live PE classes where you can pay for them to come into a virtual classroom. They can do um, video type PE classes. So I, I do not know the name off the top of my head, but my husband happens to work in a department of ed. And um, I know that he, they reached out to him and wanted to pitch their online PE um, in a box program. So I know that there, there's that one. I am not aware of any other ones. Does any of my colleagues know? looking like no. Anybody on the chat have any that they want to share? 
So if you're on the chat, we'll, um, we'll leave that out there. If you have, if you know of any programs out there, please put them in the chat box. It looks like people are looking for that. So sorry that um, I can't help you out. Once we get off of this, if you email me, I'll definitely look up the program and I can send it to you. Uh, the next question that is in here is, how are you conducting evaluation for teaching competencies if districts are not allowing in-person observation by university supervisor? I can answer, I can say a couple of things. One, we did go our, to our Department of Instruction, who is our accrediting agency in the state, and we did ask them to waive some of their rules. So we're not as, you know, we're not being um, held quite to as high of a observation standard as we have in the past. Um, but we do sometimes have student teachers record lessons and send them to their supervisors. And sometimes our student teachers have a lesson live on Microsoft Teams or Zoom or um, you know, some other device that the university supervisor can log in and watch the lesson live, but from a distance. So those are a couple of the ways that we're still doing observations even from um, outside of the classroom. And uh, I have to have a disclaimer that I've not personally used it, um, but my university uses Go React, um, which we provided the link to earlier. And that's one of the main things that Go React was actually designed for, I believe, is for doing live virtual supervision. Um, and the nice thing about it, my understanding is that it has built in functionality for providing feedback uh, directly through students right through that online tool. Um, so it's that's a an online tool that's really uh, specially designed for exactly what you're looking for, doing that uh, virtual uh, ob observation and supervision and providing feedback. I would highly recommend Go React for that reason. I've been yeah. doing it a little bit more low tech in that my students record in the gym and then they share their screen via zoom and we watch the video together on zoom and talk through it and they're able to pause it and play it and fast forward and that's how we've been doing all of our observations that's a great example thanks for sharing that elizabeth because i know sometimes like universities won't support the go react licenses and Sometimes it's hard to, to figure that out. So thanks for sharing that one. I know um, for our student teachers right now, our district, the district that we work with um, here at the Hoy DOE, they use a lot of Google Classroom. And so our university supervisors are essentially just logging into Google Classroom and observing the classroom that way. Now they do have to go through a little bit of clearing at each school where they get like an email that allows them to log in because a lot of the schools, at least here in Hawaii, have their own specific email address and only those email addresses work within that specific school. And so you kind of have to keep track of that as a university supervisor, but that's kind of how we've been, or my, um, one of our instructors has been doing those observations with our student teachers. So I don't see, oh, there is one question here about, has anyone used Nearpod for their teaching? Um, and I actually don't know what Nearpod is. So if, in, does anybody, any of the panelists know what Nearpod is? So Mark, um, you might need to give us a little bit more information on that. Um, thanks for uh, sharing that. We haven't used it, it looks like, but has anybody on the webinar that's still here used Nearpod before? It's an interactive tool like some of the others. Um, I have not used it. I know that some schools um, are. Um, uh, I mean, it's just an interactive one like Edpuzzle. I mean, it's just some of the, the same one, but no, I haven't used it. it. It's very similar to what Kim just said. The, in my experience, um, it's a little bit more friendly to a typical classroom environment than it is to a physical education setting. That's my, was my takeaway from it, from our yeah. training. I know a lot of teachers that do that are on Twitter, but I don't have Great for all of you that are sharing. Javier um, shared a video that is of Nearpod that was, can be used in an asynchronous or synchronous environment. So thanks for sharing that, Javier. And then um, Shannon talks about how she has a friend 
that uses it in her fifth grade classroom and has said positive things. And I think Mark put the link in there. So sounds like a great um, resource. So I would encourage you to check it out. I might have to, to check it out as well. Um, all right, so we have another question coming in. Um, Karen, I'll just say one last thing about Nearpod. Yep. I, I know that it is um, compatible with Canvas. So if your um, university is using Canvas as its platform, that you can integrate that app into Canvas. Yeah, thank you, Susanna. All right, so Risto made a comment in the chat and I will, I'll kind of um, agree with you here. So I think it's important that we are careful about kind of those um, box, box cur uh, curriculums or in this case, like a, a online program that essentially is here we are PE um, in a virtual box because we really wanna make sure that we're taking into account these things like trauma and social emotional learning and culturally relevant pedagogy. And when we have these curriculums that are just videos um, that our students can log on and do, although they are meeting the standards, they might be leading um, students through physical activity or, or different physical fitness aspects, we do tend to lose um, that, personal, that personal touch and thinking about who our students are. And that is a really important thing to, to keep in mind. So although they are convenient, sometimes um, they're not necessarily the best things for our students. So if you are looking into those, although they're, they are out there, I think that that's a good caution, um, Risto, that we need to be mindful of um, being culturally relevant teachers and trying to promote things that are gonna have our teachers that are out in the K through 12 school um, be culturally relevant as well. And it's hard to do that with something that is prepackaged for you essentially. Any other thoughts or comments on that? So Shannon kind of agreed in there. Is there any other questions? I don't think that we have any more questions on our board that we've seen. If we missed it, come in the chat, I apologize. Does anybody have any other questions or thoughts that they wanna put out there? We have about four minutes left. So is anyone aware of effective professional development for in-service teachers for teaching during COVID? So thanks for that question, Jeff. I'll start out by saying there's two webinars um, on Shape America's website, website that I know that the PPC um, and the people that are on this call were personally involved in. So there's one for physical education, teaching during COVID, as well as health education, two separate ones. They can also earn the um, professional development or continuing education credits. I do know, so those are free on the website. They have to create an account with Shape America, but it's not a paid account, just like put their email in, and then you can get that on the COVID resource page. Um, Sean is probably gonna be a better person to tell you what other free webinars. I know that they have a partner with CDC that is specifically around professional development and providing resources to teachers during COVID. So Sean, do you want, maybe wanna step in and talk about some of the other resources that are available as far as webinars for teachers or professional development? Yeah, so real quick, this actually will be a part of that, this one um, that we just are completing here. We also have ones that we've done back in the summertime. I think you may have just mentioned them about uh, over health education and uh, physical education in regards to our reentry considerations. Um, a lot of the work and another one that's coming up here really soon this month, Michelle Carter, she's going to be doing one on um, equity and accessibility and inclusive environments. We'll have more coming on trauma-informed schools and creating a trauma-informed uh, environment. And then also self-care is kind of one, another one of those um, um, key point areas for CDC work. So, you know, be on the lookout for things on self-care and then culturally responsive instruction in health and physical education. Great, thanks for adding those in, Sean. Does anybody know of any other ones that have been offered? Um, by other organizations? Well, I'll just add an, another one on there to the SHAPE list. Um, Chuck Corbin, Pam Colin Hodges, and I recorded one this summer for SHAPE about using conceptual PE in a virtual or hybrid learning environment. And the last I heard from SHAPE, that's supposed to be coming out in November. So hopefully they'll be putting that one out um, in the coming weeks. Awesome. Aaron, I had one down there that 
Dave Martinez did. He didn't do it for um, CEUs or anything, but he did do it as a PD for his district. And you had asked about other organizations. Um, NCPEIB did a webinar series this summer, and they're continuing to do one um, every six weeks or so. Um, so that would be another place to look. Now, Anna, could, could you put, put the name there. of that? Yeah, that would be great if you could put in there. Yeah, I'm trying to find the link to it. And then we'll try to um, maybe we'll put our brains together to try to get some links uh, for you, Jeff, if we can add them to the link page as well for some of the ones that we know of um, that are out there. So thanks for that question. I think we have time for one more question. If anybody has any burning thoughts that they want to get off their chest. So, oh, so Jenna says, have, do we have any leniency via state licensure with pre-student teaching field experience hours or requirements? Um, so I, I know in, the, in Hawaii, the Hawaii State Standard Board has been lenient about the number of hours that the students are um, need contact hours. And so they have waived some of those requirements. I'm not 100% sure exactly what they waived because we've been able to meet those requirements. I know that they have allowed the online experience. It doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. Um, so that's one of the things that our states has done. What about everybody else's? Our state has done that. It has waived some of the, we can, we, we just need to document alternative assessments that we're doing in place of field placements, pre-service. It's the same for us in Colorado. And we were actually told that if we're signing off on them, then the state is okay with it, even if they didn't have the required number of hours during this time. Yeah, so I would definitely encourage you to check um, with whatever state you're in. Uh, if there's a PE person at the state level or the university, like your education um, department in the university is where the information came for us here in Hawaii, is ask somebody like in the dean's office maybe around teacher licensure, and they should probably know what the state has come out with for your individual information. All right, well, we are out of time. So thank you so much for um, listening to all of the information that we provided you. Hopefully you're able to walk away with um, one thing that was uh, helpful for you or more. Um, just a kind of plug, there is, uh, if you're interested in joining a Shape America Council, so again, we're mostly from the Professional Preparation Council, um, but the application is open. They extended it through November 2nd, so um, if you're interested in being part of the council, I would encourage you to go and sign up. There's also the Health Education Council, Physical Education Council, Physical Activity Council, and I think the Research Council if I got them all. So anyway, um, as higher ed people, we would encourage you to, to um, put your name in the hat to, to be selected to be on a council. But thanks again for being part of this webinar. And um, we hope you have a great week and good luck with your courses this semester and next.